Well, uh, uh, a very warm welcome, everybody, um, this evening, and thank thank you so much for coming uh, in numbers. I think this uh, promises to be a really fascinating uh, session. We only have one hour, um, but I'm pretty sure it will be a, a really, an hour really well spent. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, from CEDA, the Scottish Educational Research Association, and myself, Professor Stephen McKinney, here chairing this event, to welcome uh, Keith Driver and Amalia uh, from the Scottish Government. Uh, and Keith is, is going to uh, present his talk in three sections. Uh, first of all, he's going to give an introduction to PISA, and Amalia is, is going to contribute to all the sections. Secondly, he's going to talk about PISA 2022 highlights. And finally, he's going to talk about PISA uh, data and secondary research. At the end of each section, we'll have about five minutes for any comments or, or discussion or any questions people might have before we move on to the next section. And we probably have a couple of minutes at the very end to wind up with any questions people might have. I'm really grateful to Keith and Amalia for coming along. Um, very busy people. But we, we thought it was really important uh, to hear from Scottish Government researchers about PISA um, rather than simply hearing about PISA from the media and from the newspapers and from social media. So I'm going to hand over to Keith Pryber. Uh, thank you, Stephen, very much. Um, and Angela as well for, for having us. <clears throat> uh, we're delighted that we're working closely with the CIRA network to help bring policymakers and researchers together on educational data and evidence. Um, I think this is the third joint event we've had in the last three months. We had a CIRA Connects webinar in the autumn on Scottish educational data. We had a slot at the CIRA conference on our Attainment Scotland funding evaluation. And now today speaking about what PISA can tell us about education in Scotland. Um, so my name is Keith Driver. I'm a principal research officer um, at the Scottish Government. And part of my job is to be contract manager for uh, the PISA assessments in Scotland. And um, also with me today, I've got Amalia, who's going to speak to her PhD um, project using um, PISA data at the end of this. And um, on the call as well, we've got um, National Foundation for Educational Research, who undertake the assessments on behalf of the Scottish Government in Scotland. Um, so he can answer any tough questions on that. And we have Adam Naylor as well, who's the statistician who um, knows the most about PISA data, I think, in, in Scotland. And if there's any questions on plausible values, I'm definitely passing you over to him. Um, so we want to talk about what PISA can tell us about education in Scotland, and it can tell us a lot. <clears throat> so PISA is often described as the biggest social research exercise in the world and it encompasses more than 80 education systems and more than an almost 700,000 students. Uh, of course, it's often seen as more than a social research exercise. Um, PISA is a major factor that influences education systems around the world, uh, for better or for worse, uh, and often dominate, dominates political and media agendas. To those writing the headlines, the top level scores for maths, reading and science are often the only finding that gets prominence. However, in many ways, the scores are some of the least interesting findings about PISA. If you look at the PISA international reports, all 700 pages of them so far, looking only at those three scores will only get you about 20 odd pages uh, through the 700 pages. And so there's much, much more to the PISA data than the scores. And it's a rich data set that explores not just attainment, but also the factors that support attainment, and also people's backgrounds, their attitudes to learning, their well-being, their experience at school and in the classroom, and how they all influence the lives of young people and the outcomes that they achieve in education. That's not just in the last assessment, which was in 2022, but also since the first set of assessments way back in the year 2000. PISA does receive criticism in terms of how it assesses students. It's focus uh, narrowly on three domains uh, and how the results are used or misused um, in the media and sometimes politically, uh, and much of that does need to be borne in mind. However, there's huge amounts of potential in the data to develop insights to improve education. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share my presentation quickly, and uh, just bear with me a second. As Stephen mentioned, we're going to do the presentation in three 
slots and hopefully have a chance for um, discussion and questions in between the slots. Uh, Stephen, can you tell me you can see the presentation? Yes, Keith, we can. Thank you. Yes. Super. I can't, I can't see you now, but um, just let me know if uh, I drop off or anything. So I always start uh, PISA presentations with what I call fun PISA facts, uh, things I find interesting. And, and these are just some I've taken almost at random um, yesterday, just out of interest. So firstly, what's in the name? So pupils from Scotland and Nova Scotia had uh, the same you, score for reading. You, you need to move that slide into the centre. Oh, okay. We've only, got, we've only got the title page there and we've got the other slide at the side. Uh, I've seen, I think I'm in presentation mode. Does that not come across? No. We're only getting... Uh, Keith, if you click present up at the top right-hand corner, that yeah. might help. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think I'm in. I think it's moved to a different slide. Funny enough, um, if you if you print if you click on the second slide, it should come up then. Apologies, folks. Um, I'm okay. doing a new share, and then a new tab. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, super. Thanks for pointing out. So what's in the name? So pupils from Scotland and Nova Scotia had the same score for reading in PISA 2022, which I liked as a sort of certain symmetry across the Atlantic. The friendliest school system. So Austria, Austrians are most likely to say that they make friends easily and that they feel they belong at their school. STEM impact. So 16% of UK pupils expect to work in science or engineering by the time they're 30. And this is the equal highest in the OECD. Um, so I think somewhere, somewhere, somebody who has STEM in their job title will be pleased with that. Already peaked. So internationally, attainment in PISA peaked in maths and science in 2009 and reading in 2012. I don't think pupils uh, are any less clever since then. So it'd be interesting to explore why um, attainment has decreased in PISA in that time. Higher flyers. So pupils in Singapore achieved the highest scores for maths, reading and science in PISA 2022. And finally, the happiest country. So pupils in Finland had an average life satisfaction rating of 7.41 out of 10. And so that was the highest of any country taking part in PISA. So as I mentioned, what we'll cover today, we'll cover introduction to PISA, um, key findings in 2022, and then talk a little bit about data and research in PISA. So what is PISA? So PISA, PISA stands for the Programme for International Student Assessment, and it's an assessment of 15-year-old skills which are necessary to participate in society. It takes, takes place in a three-year cycle. It's undertaken under the auspices of the OECD, and unlike other international assessments, um, such as TIMS and PEARLS, um, which uh, assess maths and science and, and literacy under the IEA, um, these which have curriculum approaches, the PISA study has test content that is independent of the participating country's school curriculum, and instead has a focus upon assessing whether 15-year-olds are able to apply what they've learned in school in real life situations. The tests at the age of 15, because that's the last broadly comparable age uh, before um, pupils and students, young people start taking different routes, whether it's into work or whether into college, further uh, higher education. It has three domains. So it assesses performance in maths, reading and science. And you can see on the right hand side here is definition of how they, um, of what they assess under each. It started in the year 2000. So the 2022 assessments were the eighth cycle and Scotland has participated in all the cycles. As well as the assessments, pupils also undertake a background questionnaire about themselves, about their attitudes, their dispositions and beliefs, their home life and their school and learning experience. Uh, head teachers also uh, undertake a questionnaire on the school. Uh, this is a map of the participating countries. 
can see on the left there are the OECD member countries and then the blue the partner countries and so the non-OECD members and then the grey um, countries that are taking part in the paths. So it's a huge range of countries around the world that take part. The assessments themselves, um, so PISA was developed and led by the OECD and is overseen by the PISA governing boards. Um, the Scottish government is one of the members of that alongside the UK government and that's all the countries that participate in PISA are part of the governing boards uh, and meet every six months. Nationally, each participating country appoints a national project manager to undertake the national assessments. In Scotland, that's the National Foundation for Education and Research, who are commissioned to undertake the assessments. Uh, I should say it's, it's a long process. So we appointed NFVR to undertake the assessments in 2018. Uh, and that contract lasted until 2023 when the results were <coughs> published. But they'll be the most recent results until December 2026. So you're talking, um, I suppose, eight years um, in which we, we work on each PISA cycle uh, based on that. Uh, the PISA assessments themselves are undertaken on computers in schools in a three hour session. So two hours of assessments, 30 minutes of the student questionnaire, and 30 minutes for breaks. The test items are a mixture of multiple choice questions and questions requiring students to construct their own response. And they're organized into groups. So there'll be a passage of tests text describing a real life situation, and then a mixture of questions based on that. There are more than 15 hours of test items for maths, reading and science. So students take a different combination of these. And maths was the major domain this year that rotates in the cycle, so next time will be science. That means 94% of students uh, cover an hour of maths and then cover another 60 minutes to one of the other um, three minor innovative domains. Uh, this is what PISA looks like, so it's completely online. Um, this is one of the, the easier maths uh, examples, I believe. Um, but basically, you do all the working online, which makes it quite different to the way that we undertake assessments uh, in Scotland and the UK. In terms of sampling, um, so this is uh, undertaken in conjunction with international contractor and our national contractor, the NFER. So we have a sample that stratifies uh, by funding type, by school attainment, by gender, or whether it's a male mixed or female school, and area type um, broken down by the, the Scottish classifications in Oregon Road, just to ensure that the, the sample of schools is um, representative of Scotland. Based on that, we're given 121 schools in the main sample. And so our contractors are given that by the international contractors and they're to try to get as many of those date parts as possible. And we also get a list of first replacements and second replacements. So if any of the schools in the main sample can't take part, then they all have a second and third um, replacement that, um, that can then take over. And in terms of students, through each participating school, 40 students are randomly sampled to each school. And there's guidance on pupils that can be excluded from the sample due to SEN or language issues. I just want to flag up uh, PISA te technical standards. So there are actually 82 PISA technical standards uh, that we need to conform to. And there are three that are the ones that we focus most on. So the first that is school level exclusions and within school occlusion, exclusions combined to an <coughs> exceed 5% of the total student population. Uh, the school response rate needs to be at least 85% of the sample of eligible and non-excluded schools. And finally, the student response rate, those sitting actually who successfully sit, the assessments needs to be at least 80% of all those samples. Uh, I just want to say quickly about why PISA 2022 was different. So for this one, the main domain was, was maths. And um, there's always an innovative domain. So last time that was on global competence, uh, and this time was on creative thinking. So that we didn't take part in the assessment for that, um, but we took part in questions in the student questionnaire around creative thinking. It was very much an exceptional assessment. So it was originally scheduled for 2020-21, um, but was postponed across all countries for 12 months due to the impact of the pandemic. And it's worth pointing out that administration of this assessment took place at the tail end of the, of the pandemic uh, from October 2022 for us, which impacted on participation. 
but for pupils in Scotland and in many other countries, uh, learning took place remotely for at least eight months in the two and a half years prior to the assessment. So they're very much not the same type of cohort as in the previous PISA, PISA assessments, and, and that none of the other cohorts who took part will have had that same experience of having to learn at home for such a long period of time. Uh, and quickly, the results are published internationally and nationally on the first Tuesday in December, the year following the assessment. So we've noticed last month that the latest PISA, PISA 2022 was published on the 3rd of December. And then from this point on, all international data from the assessments are made available. The initial focus in, I suppose, politically and in the media is very much on the scores and maths, uh, reading and science. Uh, and this has led to the phenomenon of the PISA shock, which actually happened in the very first PISA back in um, PISA 2000, when Germany had much lower scores than they thought they would, and um, subsequently um, launched an, a number of reforms in the education system. And I think every cycle of PISA you get, um, at least some countries that experience something similar. Um, but then following that, probably for the two years following that, then the OECD governments and researchers then use the data for secondary analysis. Um, I just had a quick look at different headlines from across, across the world um, from the last month. Um, so you can see it's very high profile, often quite negative, um, but we very much want to get past that. So we, we want to get past this very black and white um, reading off the scores um, so that we have a much more nuanced uh, view um, of what drives um, attainment and outcomes in education. So I put a note for a pause here uh, and to take time for any questions or reflections at this stage. Okay, uh, if anybody has a question uh, or a comment they, they, they would like to make at this point, you can either put it in the chat. I think we're small enough, that, small enough that you can raise a hand if you can. And then, Angela, if you keep an eye out. Does anybody have a comment or question or reaction even? Got Emma's asked a question. Emma, okay. Emma, uh, see, um, so Keith, Emma's asked there were 117 schools in total. How many were private or independent in that number? Hmm, that's a very good question. I don't have that in front of me. I, I wonder, uh, David, if you're on the call, do you, do you remember that figure? Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't have that in front of me either. Um... <clears throat> Well, I'm sure Emma can follow that up um, yeah. later. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Um, another question from uh, Dr. Zembat. Um, did Scotland take part in financial literacy part of PISA? Uh, we didn't. And I, I don't believe we've taken part in the past. Um, we've always taken part in the ICT familiarity study, which is quite an old fashioned way of, of uh, talking about, I suppose, digital uh, literacy um, of peoples. So we did have that additional part of the questionnaire. Um, and then in 2018, we took part in the teacher questionnaire as well, but we haven't taken part in the financial literacy one. Okay. Um, Adam Naylor has given us a, a, a useful comment that if there were private schools included, they would be proportional to the percentage of private schools in Scotland. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Okay, any, any other comments, questions, reactions on... I was very, I really enjoyed, if that's the right word, to see those reactions from around the world, to see that we're not quite so unique after all. No, we're definitely not unique. I think it comes across as that when you do see the newspaper headlines in your own country, but as soon as you look at others and you realise we're in a similar boat, I think. Okay, Keith, I think we'd be best to move on because time's about you want, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I've shared the wrong one. Bear with me a second. Sorry, we use Teams, so used to using Teams. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to reflect on the PISA 2022 key findings and, and let you know the type of data that's there. Uh, and just to signpost you first um, to a series of reports 
and that you can access. So the one on the left is the Scottish Government's highlights from the Scotland results, um, which myself, uh, Adam and McCollum and Alison as well as statisticians worked on. Uh, NFER and David's put together a report on the PISA 2022 student sample in Scotland. So it's a detailed report saying how the assessments were carried out. And then on the right, you can see the, the Brew report is the, the international findings, which you can get on the OECD website. Uh, just to point out in the Scottish sample, so there were 117 schools took part in Scotland, which was a 96% school response rate overall, um, which far exceeded the 85% that were required. We had 3,257 students taking part. And that's actually the highest number of participating schools and participating students we've managed in a PISA sample. Unfortunately, that was slightly below the student response rate required of 80%. As part of PISA, which meant we had, we undertook a student level non response bias analysis, and the OECD concludes that its possibility of more than minimal bias was might likely introduced in the estimates. But they did deem that the PISA 2022 Scotland data was deemed comparable to previous cycles. We weren't the only country, I think uh, every um, country in the UK had, had a similar. Um, position and I think 14 other countries or 13 other countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Netherlands, Ireland, and the USA, and didn't reach the participation rate. Um, I'm going to um, just share the international findings, but I'm also going to tell you what the OECD concluded. So, this was the very first PISA assessment of 15 year old students since COVID 19. Uh, disrupted education. They described it as unprecedented results. Uh, mean performance in OECD countries fell by 15 points in mathematics and by 10 score points in reading. Uh, they say this is roughly the same as a half a year's worth of learning in reading and three quarters of a school year in mathematics. In contrast, average performance in science did not alter significantly. And uh, it's important to look at the context. So in two decades of PISA tests, the OECD average score has never changed by more than four points in maths or five points in reading between consecutive assessments. This is what makes PISA 2022 results so unique. The dramatic fall in performance suggests a negative shock affecting many countries at the same time COVID-19 would appear to be an obvious factor. However, they do caution that uh, trend analysis of PISA results before 2018 revealed that performance in reading and science began to decline well before the pandemic. Um, so you can see that in maths, um, peaked in 2009 and has been a downward trend since then, in reading in 2012, and then in science in 2012 as well. One thing to point out is that PISA moved from paper-based to computer-based in 2015. So it's interesting that results have been lower since then, though it's not been firmly established um, if that's a causative factor of that. So in terms of Scotland's results, um, these scores don't necessarily mean too much in themselves. Um, so these are average, the mean score for students in, in Scotland, basically. The 471 for maths, 493 in reading, and 483 for science. Um, so maths was lower than the PISA 2018 score for Scotland, but was similar to the OECD average. Reading was lower than it was for Scotland in 2018, but was higher than the OECD average. And then science was similar to what was in Scotland in PISA 2018 and remained similar to the OECD average. You can see in these charts here, the blue is the, the Scotland mean scores per um, each cycle and the gray is the OECD average. So you can see in maths, uh, apart from the, I suppose you could say a strong start in maths, we broadly um, mirrored the, the math score uh, through OEC average since then. And you can see we, we had a similar fall to the OEC average there. In reading, we've broadly in recent years been ahead of the OEC average, but we had a similar fall in this assessment. In science, you can see the pattern of um, attainment in PISA has been similar between um, Scotland and the OEC average. Um, comparing with the rest of the UK, uh, Scotland is similar to England for reading, but England is higher than Scotland for maths and science. And Northern Ireland uh, were similar for maths, reading and science. 
And for Wales, we're similar for maths, but Wales is lower than Scotland for maths and science. You can see the scores in the table there. Uh, this chart here shows math scores. So I just put this in here to show the trends data, but also the fact that all the four uh, UK nations saw the same type of fall in maths uh, in this period. Uh, this uh, chart um, shows all of the OECD countries. Um, so the dark blue are the countries that are statistically significantly ahead of Scotland. The light blue are those that are statistically similar to Scotland. And the pinky peachy ones are the ones that are significantly below Scotland. So you can see in maths and science, there are a higher number of countries that are ahead of Scotland. But in reading, there are only what, seven countries in the OECD that are statistically above Scotland. Um, I've tried to paraphrase a certain poet here, and was like, or I can't say it, was like us. Um, so it's damn few, I mean, damn few, and they're all in Europe. So we're, we're similar to France, Germany, and Italy for maths and science, but actually we're higher than France and Germany for reading. Uh, and interestingly, um, Northern Ireland is the country that we're most similar to for all domains. Uh, and we're relatively unusual in the data for having a significantly higher score for reading than for maths and science. A quick focus on maths, because maths was the major domain. So this gives you a bit of detail, um, which I'll not go through in, in huge detail in terms of um, the types of data we can have in terms of standard deviation, which shows there's more deviation in scores than there were in 2012, 20, 2006, 2012, and 2015, and more than there was in 2018. We can see that performance among boys was higher than among girls in maths, um, and that's been some the, the same as um, pattern as every PISA assessment apart from one. However, girls scored higher in reading and performance in science was similar. At the bottom left here, um, what the OECD do is they um, have six different proficiency levels and they sort um, pupils into each based on their score. And you can see on the left here, these are um, students in Scotland that were below level one per maths. So you can see that's an increasing proportion of, of pupils, particularly in the last two, that have been below level one. And then the sort of green colours on, on the right hand side are the, are the students that are termed as high performance. And this is a passion that's seen across most OECD countries as well. Um, and the top left here, top right here, sorry, um, this is the share of variation in maths performance that ex explains by um, social background in OECD countries. So the, the ones between the bars are the ones that are most similar to Scotland. So the majority of countries have a similar amount of performance explained by social background. So we're similar to OECD average, but notably countries like Canada, England, um, and Wales had less of the performance explained by social backgrounds. On the right, you can see countries like France and Switzerland um, were much more um, and you call that sense. Uh, I mentioned ESCS there, that's the PISA Index of Economic, Social and Cultural Status. And um, so this is a composite, composite score that combines into a single score information from three components. It's parents' highest level of education, parents' highest occupational status, and then home possessions, which is a proxy for family wealth. And this information um, is taken from students in the student questionnaire um, and this chart here shows something called um, resilient students. So it's students who are in the bottom quarter for social backgrounds, the ESES, but perform in the top quarter in terms of their maths performance. So you can actually see the UK is what broadly six, I think, in terms of the highest number of resilient students. But I suspect that's driven probably more by England, but it'd be interesting to see where Scotland was on that chart. Uh, this is a quick comparison across Europe in terms of the change in PISA math scores between 2018 and 2022. So you can see the UK had a drop of 13 and the Ireland a drop of 8. You can see a lot of other countries like Iceland minus 36, Norway minus 33, and Poland minus 26, Germany minus 25. You can see there's a similar pattern right across Europe. Very quickly, I'll not go into detail on this, but these are the math subscales. So um, there are definitions to all of these, but we can see underneath the math scores what people's 
were more comfortable with in terms of questions. So you can see that people's more com comfortable in questions around uncertainty and data, reasoning, interpreting, interpreting, applying and evaluating than they were for, say, employing concepts, facts and procedures and changing relationships. And um, we were broadly similar to the OECD average for most of them, but we were uh, behind England on, on every one of them. Um, as part of the student questionnaire, there are a number of questions around maths. Uh, so these are a few examples. Um, the bottom one I think is particularly interesting. So it's to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? And it's questions around maths anxiety or maths worry. So whether you get worried about maths classes, whether you feel anxious about falling behind, and they use this to have a com composite score um, about maths anxiety. I think they've shown that that's um, correlated with performance in maths as well. Also asks about how um, students uh, take part in class and what topics they cover in class, how their teacher supports them. So there's, there's a wealth of data um, behind the scores in terms of people's actually experience and attitudes towards math. Uh, moving on to the student questionnaire. Um, so the OECD added questions around the experience of school building closures um, to the student questionnaire. So there's some really interesting context to the, to the attainment scores here. So I think a crucial one is probably the middle one at the top. So 77% of learners felt that they learned less at home than they would have done at school. And that's compared to the new OECD average of 55%. Can you look top left? Less, fewer than half of learners felt well prepared to learn on their own in Scotland, and that was below the average of 55%. Um, <clears throat> but slightly more positively at the top right, 60% of learners felt that their teachers were well prepared to teach remotely, and that's compared to the average of 55%. And if you look at the charts, um, you can see motivated to learn on the left hand side, um, students in Scotland, I, I'll say students because the OECD uses that term, but referring to 15 year olds. Um, so less than a quarter of um, pupils in Scotland um, felt that they were motiv motivated to learn at home, and that's compared to almost 40% across the OECD. And then along to the right, you can see the students in Scotland were more likely to say that they fell behind in the schoolwork when they were at home. Slightly more positively, two thirds of students felt a sense of belonging to the school um, that they go to, and that's higher than it was in 2018. So actually there's been a slight increase in sense of belonging. There's also been a slight increase in um, life satisfaction. So these are the number of pupils that say they're between seven and 10 on a life satisfaction scale. So that's, uh, life satisfaction seems to have gone up, but it's still below the OECD average. Uh, more interesting things in the student questionnaire. So we can see that just over 10% of learners in Scotland were termed as frequently bullied. This was lower than it was in PISA 2018, but still higher than the OEC average. We found more than a quarter of learners in Scotland said that students don't listen to what the teacher says in most lessons. This is actually lower than it was in 2018 and lower than the OECD average. There's lots of questions around digital. So students reported that they spent around 2.2 hours on digital devices on learning activities at school and that this was higher than the OECD average of two hours and it was actually quite a lot higher than the UK, UK average as well. On the flip side of that, um, almost a third of learners in Scotland said that they're distracted by using digital devices in most lessons and um, that's higher than the, the OECD average. Um, more positively, seven out of ten Learners report that their parents' carers ask them how well they're doing at school at least once a week, and that's higher than the OECD average. And across all measures of um, parental engagement, actually, Scotland was higher than the OECD average. Um, so I'm going to pause there before we move on to a bit more on data and research side uh, and take any questions or reflections on the 2022 data. Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, fascinating stuff, folks. Um, has anybody got a question or a comment? Um, I, I've actually got a comment which surprised me. You said that Northern Ireland was very similar to Scotland, and yet Northern Ireland has really quite a different educational system. They still have grammar schools. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose similar in terms of the attainment scores they had. 
Um, yeah, and, and that, and that in do, itself is yeah. quite interesting because they do have a very uh, different kind of education. So, okay, any comments or questions from the house? Um, <laughs> uh, we've, well, first of all, we've got clarification that a total of five independent schools participate in PISA 2022. Back to Emma again. How did Scotland rate for maths anxiety? Um, that's a good question. Thanks, Emma. Um, so that wasn't published in the the first tranche of results um, in the reports um, in December. That's something we're working on at the moment. Um, so we're planning a follow up um, sort of output that will focus much more on maths and, and particularly around the maths uh, student questionnaire. Uh, questions and um, so that's something we'll, we'll, we're definitely intending to to publish and use more of in the future but we haven't got all those figures in yet okay bro thanks keith anybody else have anything to say oh, uncharacteristically quiet <laughs> okay keith back to you and we can we can certainly oh hang on Alan Britton, um, it would be interesting to cross-reference some of the PISA detail against the Health and Wellbeing Survey, Keith. I think that leads us quite well onto the data side. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, I suppose just, just on, on that point, we collect the pupil candidate numbers so everybody takes part in PISA, which allows it to be linked to any administrative education data, including the Health and Wellbeing Census. So that's a good point in that. It would be interesting and it would be possible to, to make that comparison. Um, Thanks, Alan. And back to you, Keith. Okay. Okay, so moving on to PISA data and secondary analysis. And I will invite Amalia to speak in a minute um, so you won't hear my voice the whole time. So a little bit on um, how data is available, and as I might want to come in on this if, uh, if I'm getting anything wrong, that basically the, um, at the link at the top, you can download the whole piece of data set for every country. Um, you wouldn't want to because it would probably blow up your computer because it's such a uh, huge amount of data. And uh, you can download it, I think, in SPSS and SAS, or you can choose um, international data set or individual countries or, you know, um, three or four different countries, it's it's up to you, but all the data is open source there. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily easy to use all the data. So there's a PISA data analysis manual that you probably want to um, refer to if you're, you're keen on using them. And um, there's a <clears throat> copy of every questionnaire that's used uh, for PISA 2022. So you can see all the questions that were asked. Um, there's also uh, PISA Data Explorer, which is a, quite an accessible way of exploring the data. So it didn't have all the data, um, but you can see here it's just a question of um, look at the variables that you're interested in, and it generates reports for you. Well, it can also generate charts and uh, tests of statistical significance as well. So it's a very useful tool. I did something that you very much shouldn't do, but just uh, had a bit of fun playing with it uh, earlier on. So I was looking at how math scores um, differs according to different variables. So the, the one on the right um, is how math score, and this is for the UK, not just for Scotland, how it differs for, depending on what students said, their highest parental education was. So it goes all the way <clears throat> up to doctoral level. And um, it's quite amusing there was a drop off at doctoral level. Um, I think that's probably due to the sample size. But certainly you can see there's a positive trend uh, going upwards uh, depending on your, your parental education. Um, I tried it for use of digital for leisure. Um, this isn't, um, this is just a, uh, I suppose a descriptive chart. It doesn't uh, account for um, differences in background and so on. Um, but you can see um, that those that do use um, digital for leisure had better scores, but th th there's a drop off past a certain point. So once you get past a certain point, and this is shown in international data as well, actually your scores um, go up um, start to fall again. But this is just an example of me playing around um, and these are the type of charts that you can produce. Um, I had a look at um, research using or on PISA. Um, I haven't had 
too much of a chance to look at this, but there was interesting reports that um, that looked at the different um, to articles that have been written on PISA, and this was published in 2016, so that's the chart on the right, and um, shows that you know it's increasing number of particularly secondary data analysis papers that were being um, produced at that point, and I imagine that's probably increased again. Um, equally, it have been um, a big increase in looking at research on PISA, so in terms of impacts uh, on policy and, and the sort of discourse, and also quite a number of uh, articles looking at a critique and technical issues with the PISA assessment. Um, and then the, the, the table at the bottom, you can see the top five countries that were producing um, PISA research. So uh, USA, Australia, Germany, UK, and Ireland. And um, equally, there's only been 18 that they found, the research funds that were on educational research in the UK uh, using PISA. And the, the four papers I've put there are recent uses of data. So um, top one, sorry, I haven't had citations here, but this is um, Australian University using PISA data to look at the impact of curriculum policy change. Um, and then Edinburgh Uni looking at school subject choices and social class differences in entry to higher education. And there was a recent article on perceptions of key education actors towards PISA and um, the case of Scotland, which is very interesting looking at uh, research on PISA. And um, last slides before I move on to Amalia. So I suppose these are areas of research interest from, from my point of view, reading on the PISA data and um, Scottish government priorities. So maths is obviously a huge priority, uh, given the score and, and the recent announcement of um, the um, sort of curriculum review cycle. So in maths, what are the factors that support attainment? On social backgrounds, who are the resilient students? And what, and what are factors linked to their attainment? And what are the links between experiences of learning at home and the impacts of the pandemic and attainment and wellbeing? And so past PISA assessments, so pre previous participants in PISA are now aged 21, around 21 from PISA 2018 and 24 for PISA 2015. So what more do we know about those cohorts in terms of what happened next for them? Uh, do PISA data complement other educational data sets? Um, so we mentioned before that um, people can number numbers collected for every people. So, so how can we use those data linkages uh, to understand more um, about our pupils? And finally, comparative study studies. What can we learn from the differences between countries? But th these are ones just from me. Um, I think there's any number of different research or uh, <clears throat> analyses you can undertake using PISA. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Amalia. Um, hi everyone. Um, let me just try to share my screen. Um, oh, just give me one second. Oh. Try it again, Amalia. You need to stop. Don't yes. Get into and go back into to share. Ah, okay. Let me see. Yep. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, and put it into yes, the presentation. Okay. Mode. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, amazing. Um. Yes. Um. Hi everyone. Um. My name is Amalia. I'm a second year PhD student at the Moray House School of Education and Sport, University of Edinburgh. My um uh, my research title the for the formal research title is inequalities in STEM education in Scotland, but then it gets narrowed down to using PISA, SQA, and school census data to investigate the role of family and school factors on STEM subject choices. So I'm focusing on family factors, individual factors, and also school factors that influence what subjects um students take in National Five Higher and Advanced Higher. Um. So these are three um, research questions that I am uh, trying to answer. The first one is in relation to the gender inequalities in STEM subject choices, where I focused on five science and mathematics subjects, which include biology, mathematics, chemistry, physics, and computing science. And then the second block of research questions are trying to understand the social inequalities in subject choices. And then the third block of the questions are related to the school factors, teaching practices, and also STEM subject choices. 
So these are more details about the research questions that I'm trying to understand. Um, in the first part of my um, research, I'm going to understand the gender gaps in STEM subject choice and then the role of academic performance. Um, this, um, to answer the second sub-research question, the role of academic performance, this, um, the use of PISA assessment abilities and also the SQA um, examinations result data are very, very important. I'm going to explain later on how um, I will use um, the linked data set between PISA, SQA, and also Scottish um, census survey, school census survey, uh, school census, school survey data, I'm sorry. Um, and then I will also try to understand the role of attitudes towards science because we have this data in the PISA 2015. The second block of my research question is trying to answer the socioeconomic gaps and again also the role of academic performance in determining students' subject choices in National 5, Higher and Advanced Higher. And the third part of my question is trying to understand the variation across schools and then um, the influence of school socioeconomic composition and also the peer subject choices, which, which means that what um, the students in that school choose in national five higher and advanced higher. And then the last part of the thesis is hoping to answer whether there are certain encouragement or I wouldn't say teaching practices per se, but more like experiences in the science classroom that might influence students' uh, STEM-related subject choices. Those are my um, three block of the research questions and the details of the research questions. And then to answer those questions, I am using three linked data sets. Um, thanks to Keith and the Education Analytical Services team, we got access to the PISA 2015 and then SQA examinations data and also school census data. So basically, um, we are using, uh, basically we have 3,000, uh, th around 3,000 students in PISA 2015. And then these 3,000 students, we obtain their SQA examination as well, the SQA exam uh, data as well. So we got 3,000 students in PISA. And then more for this 3,000 students, we got their SQA, what subjects they are taking, and then um, what um, grade they achieve in that subject and so on. And then for the 100 and, uh, 110 school participated in PISA, we also obtain some um, socioeconomic composition um, information from the school census data. I'm going to explain a little bit more detail um, now. So for the PISA data that I'm using to answer my research questions, I'm using PISA 2015 data. As Kate mentioned, PISA is the Program for International Student Assessment administered every three years. And for the PISA 2015, there are 3,111 pupils participating in the PISA distributed across 100 um, online schools. And the good thing about PISA data is normally when people think of PISA data, they think of the assessment, they think of the PISA math, PISA science, and then PISA reading score. But in, in my research here, the main point is not only the PISA assessment, but also we are using the PISA student survey data. And the student survey data we have, aside from the ability assessment, we have some pupils background, including their uh, parents' education, parents' socioeconomic status, parents' um, occupation, and so on. We have information about their learning experiences in the classroom. We have their motivation, their attitude towards science, and also their views on science in PISA 2015. In addition to that, we are also using um, PISA school survey, which includes a lot of information on the school management and then teaching staff, assessment and evaluation, targeted groups, school climate, and so on. So PISA is actually, um, PISA goes beyond just the ability assessment, but also it has a lot of very individual level information that is very, very useful um, to answer some social research questions. Um, the second data set is the SQA examinations data. This is the Scottish qualification attainment data of pupils participated in PISA 2015. So we linked PISA data and then with the SQA examinations and we got like 3,005 pupils where um, we have information on their qualification type and level, the subject name, the results or the grades, the attainment year, and also the stage in which pupils took their examinations. So we have those information. We have from here, we can see the longitudinality nature of the data where we have um, the pupils information on the 2015. And then we have what subjects they are taking in the in the next following years in 2015, 16, 17, and also 18. So we can see how um, the, the important um the important experiences, for example, when they are 15 years old, might influence um, how they choose their subjects. 
um in addition to that because the uh some part of my um of my research will answer the role of academic performance this is also very important um in terms of the theoretical perspective of whether um whether ability assessment that we can say with the ability assessment or the actual official examinations play a big role in explaining um the educational decision making that students make there's also some very important um gaps in the literature that i'm trying to understand in my research as well so having both measurement ability measurement by a piece measured by pisa and also ability measurement um, measured officially by SQA examinations are very, very important from the theoretical framework as well. The third data set that I'm going to use, that I'm using, is the school census data. Again, 2014-2018. This is the school-level data set of schools who participated in PISA 2015. We have 101 schools, um, all the public schools, uh, sorry, the state schools. We have um, very important variables in um, in relation to the school socioeconomic composition. We have percentage of pupils registered for preschool meals, number of pupils in HSIM depend, percentage of pupils from urban, rural, small town areas, absence attendance rate, ethnicity composition, number of pupils with um, additional support needed, um, English uh, support, and so on. So we have a socioeconomic composition, and this is also one of the most important part in um, understanding uh what uh what how school plays important roles in shaping educational decision making in this case in shaping the subject choices in national five higher and advanced higher um this is my last my, my um last slide so uh, what i'm hoping to achieve from this research that i'm hoping to contribute to some not only theoretical contribution but also the policy contribution mainly um i'm hoping to add evidence on whether standardized ability assessment in this case PISA or performance in the official examinations plays more important roles in student subject choice because this is also one of the big gap um in the literature in the decision making related literature and then I'm hoping to provide recommendations to policymakers and school educators for example how policies should be tailored in the to group characteristics how teachers could contribute to improving STEM participation among secondary school students and so on I'm hoping to demonstrate the benefits of linking the international data set with individual level and school census data to answer research and policy questions. And from the research point of view, this is a this is one of the most efficient way to do research with secondary data because again, PISA data they don't only um collect they don't only measure they don't only assess the ability but they also collect individual level information, socioeconomic background, experiences, attitudes, and so on. And then um, we have those information. Imagine that if we do the survey by ourselves, it's going to be um, taking a lot of resources. But since we already have this information and then we are able to link that with another data set, that's actually the most efficient way of conducting research, especially the um, quantitative secondary data analysis research. So. I'm hoping that if I can demonstrate the benefits of linking those data set, hopefully this can open many opportunities for the collaboration between academics, data center, I mean, the data available and also the government in the future. Um, yes, which I'm hoping to contribute to further use of data linkage in Scotland beyond education related topics. And also the most important thing is bringing closer together the collaboration between academic and policymaker and also um, make data linkage something that is very um you know common in the in the research to be replicated in other countries so if we can do this and Scot if Scotland can do this then other countries which have similar data set could do this as well um so that's a little bit overview of my research if you are interested in my research or to talk to discuss more about the topics or about how i use this data what research what what quantitative methods that i'm using in um in conducting the analysis feel free to send me an email this is an email and I'm, i will be um happy to chat more about that thank you thank thank you so much amalia uh keith we, we have we have a, a question which is which is uh Kind of hangover from the last section um, from Kumara. Are there any questions related to learning for sustainability in the science questionnaire? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so the global competence um, assessment that took 
uh, place in 2018 that we took part in was very applicable to learning for sustainability. Though I'm, I, 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 that is certainly you know five years ago now. Some of those questions came over into the sort of main questionnaire this time around. So some of those are repeated. Uh, and others will be the repeated in PISA 2025, take, taking part next year. Um, and learning for sustainability is so cross-cutting, um, it's definitely worth the look at the questionnaire because uh, I won't be able, I probably won't have spotted all the different uh, applications or questions that, that apply to learning for sustainability. So it's worth a look at the questionnaire so that there are some that are in there and some that will be asked next year as well. Um, I just want to say that. Sorry, I just want to say thanks to Malia quickly. I think it was really powerful um, description of, of how, uh, an example of how you can use PISA data linked to so Scottish data to answer um, research questions. So we're really excited about what will come uh, from that. Okay, so we've got a question from Amalia. Um, are these data sets yeah. e easily accessible, accessible to, public? to the public? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Donna. Um, yeah, so for the PISA, the PISA 2015, everything is accessible in the OECD website. Um, for the linking data, I think Keith is probably the best person to answer that question. Uh, yes, so um, it's Adam who's just ducked out of the call um, to pick up kids, so I, I'll just volunteer him for everything. But, uh, Adam Naylor is our, our kind of go-to person for data linkage, so if you have any data linkage queries or uh, want to make an application, um, there's a... Sorry, I've forgotten the, the email on the website, but it's Asim who is responsible for them on um, education analytical services. Um, so we, we're happy to talk to you about any um, data linkages that you're you're hoping to make. Um, and we're hoping to have, in the future, to have sort of research-ready linked databases uh, with PISA, um, but that's um, a work in progress as well. So if you have any questions, just feel free to, to, to email me and I'll, I'll point in the right direction. Hey, thanks, Keith. Thanks, Amalia. Um, any other? We've only got a couple of minutes left, folks. So, any other questions or comments? Um, Donna says thank you. <laughs> um, can I? I was just going to add that um, sustainability will be a focus in the twenty twenty five um, questionnaires for science. So, um, though we don't, you know, though it'll it'll be something that that will be from historical ones but going forward that will be one of the subject fo focuses um for that survey but obviously the results of that won't be out until two years down the line but it it is something that will be considered um as as an important topic um in 2025 okay thanks 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 very much david um and really i suppose um we have really come to the end i really uh would like to take this opportunity to thank Keith and Amalia uh, for their time and for the fascinating overviews of PISA. Uh, I think the message we wanted to get across between CIRA and Scottish Government Research uh, is uh, a lot of this data is available and, and Keith would really encourage people, researchers to look at the data. And I think it was fantastic to, to hear from Amalia how, uh, you know, a small case study of how somebody is actually using the, the PISA material, cross-referencing cross it uh, and probing probing the data. We, we, we are a research association. Um, we're not the social media and we're not the media. We're here to probe the data. And as Keith said at the very beginning, probe the data in all its nuances and have a, a much wider and deeper appreciation of what the PISA data can tell us. So I think we're really grateful, Keith, that you've given us this time. And, Amalia, and also for, for the other people who've come along from Scottish Government Research uh, this afternoon as well, this evening, um, who are here. Also, thank you so much for all those who've attended. I'm um, really grateful you have also given the time. Um, our view is from CIRA, we're opening up a conversation. We're not closing down a conversation. This is not a kind of one-off event. We're opening up a conversation, a dialogue that we hope will continue uh, in not just into the near future, but the long-term future as well. So uh, thank you so much, everybody. Once again, thanks, Keith and Amalia. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. Have a good evening.